Well, this coming week is an anniversary that undoubtedly will not be celebrated or perhaps even commemorated or perhaps even barely noticed in the newspapers and on television. On August 6, 1945, the U.S. Air Force dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And three days later, a week from today, August 9, 1945, another bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Between the two of them, well over 200,000 people died instantly. Probably no instrument of war in the history of the world has been as devastating as the dropping of those two bombs. In addition to the immediate death toll, hundreds of thousands of survivors suffered radiation poisoning and died slow, agonizing deaths. If you read some of the stories from the eyewitnesses of what they saw, it is perhaps far, far more gruesome than the worst teenage horror movie. Skin just sliding off of people's bodies while they were still alive. The, the most gruesome deaths that were suffered. People were burned as though they had been placed in microwave ovens. Such an assault on a quarter to a half million people who eventually died could be justified only in the most extreme circumstances, in a situation in which far, far, far more lives would have been saved by dropping the bombs than by not dropping the bombs and letting those other people die. But it can't, in, on such a scale, you can't have, well, it might have or it could have or it seems as though you'd have to have absolute evidence, far more evidence than George Bush presented, for instance, that he knew that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda. Nothing less than absolute evidence could justify such a horrific act as the dropping of the atomic bombs. Well, the justification came actually about two years after the dropping of the bomb. Henry Stimson, who had been the Secretary of War when the bomb was dropped, wrote an article in Harper's Magazine, and he said, quote, We estimated that if we should be forced to carry the invasion plan to its conclusion, the major fighting would not end until the latter part of 1946 at the earliest. I was informed that such operations might be expected to cost over a million casualties to American forces alone. A million casualties. Well, various figures got bandied around as a result of that. Harry Truman sometimes said a quarter of a million of our young manhood would have died. Other times he said 100,000 or 200,000. He never could get his facts straight. And even when he was writing his own memoirs, it was pointed out to him that his figures were not consistent with Stimson, so he just changed everything that he said and wrote from then on to a million Americans would have died in an invasion of Japan. Well, from all that has come the mythology of the atomic bomb, and that mythology really centers upon two assumptions. The first is only two alternatives were available to the United States in 1945 to force the Japanese to surrender, that is, and end the war. Either invade with ground troops and suffer enormous casualties, or use the atomic bomb. And, of course, the second assumption is that the invasion would have cost hundreds of thousands of American lives. Well, given this understanding, it's not surprising that most Americans believe the dropping of the bomb was justified. But, as usual, the common wisdom is far from complete. In the summer of 1945, there were actually five alternatives that were being discussed and considered by the military high command, including first Roosevelt and then later Truman. Each of these five alternatives assumed that the Japanese would surrender and the war would be over. The first was the invasion of Japan. Not necessarily first in order of importance, but just first on a list of five. An invasion of Japan. Number two, continuing the blockade of the Japanese islands, which was already in progress. The Japanese were slowly starving to death. They don't produce much food in Japan. Rice is the number one staple, and they don't even produce it in Japan. And their fleet was gone. The American fleet had the Japanese islands surrounded. They could not get supplies from anywhere in Asia. In fact, their lack of natural resources was the reason they went hunting for colonies throughout Southeast Asia to try to get the resources that they couldn't produce themselves. So if this blockade just continued for a few months longer, it would drive the Japanese to have to surrender. The third was that now that the war in Germany was over, they figured that Soviets would be declaring war as they had promised to do, and of course as they eventually did. The fourth was using the atomic bomb, and the fifth alternative was to modify the terms of surrender that they had been demanding of Japan. They had, since early in the war, been demanding unconditional surrender. No terms. You just say, I surrender, and you submit to whatever we tell you, which is all Japanese assumed would mean probably hanging the Japanese emperor as a war criminal. Now, because so much has flowed from the use of the atomic bomb, I think it's important to be aware of what was going on. The invasion of Japan was an obvious possibility, but nobody in the United States government really thought that the invasion was ever going to take place. And if it did take place, they were planning it because they had to plan for everything. But the invasion of a remote Japanese island wasn't even going to take place until three months after the time the bomb was dropped, and the invasion of Japan itself wasn't going to take place until May of 1946, almost a year after the bomb actually was dropped. And secondly, they figured that if that invasion took place, the casualties would be somewhere around twenty or 30,000 men. 
The second alternative was the blockade, and there was no question that if they just waited the Japanese out, they would have to surrender. The third was the Soviet Union, and that was something that took place right after the bomb was dropped. The final one was changing the terms of surrender. The Japanese had already offered to surrender. The only thing that they asked for was that the emperor be allowed to stay on the throne. And before the bomb was dropped, Truman was aware of these offers of surrender from the Japanese, and he had rejected them. In Potsdam, at the conference between Churchill, Stalin, and Truman, the high commands of the British and Americans discussed all of this with regard to what should be done, and they decided that now that the bomb was available, they would make an announcement to the Japanese, tell them that they had the bomb, that they were prepared to use it, and that they were prepared to leave the emperor on the throne if the Japanese would surrender. This was understood when everybody left Potsdam, but Truman and his Secretary of State, James Burns, went back to America on a, on a ship, and on that ship, Truman wrote a speech, which he delivered as soon as he got back to the United States, reiterating the unconditional surrender terms and saying that we were going to fight this war to the end. And a couple of days later, the bomb was dropped. Well, as you can see, this is one more war in which a great mythology has built up uh, about it. And the importance of this is that we need to understand that government has to be restrained, that we cannot let people like Harry Truman or Franklin Roosevelt or George W. Bush or Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton or any of these people have the power to destroy so many lives, have the power to let the world live in fear of us, have the power to create these kinds of situations. Franklin Roosevelt lied us into the Second World War. Harry Truman lied us to the conclusion of the war. And, of course, that's just one war. There have been so many. And, of course, there are a lot of people who are very concerned about the A-bomb, and they want to assure that it is never dropped again. Unfortunately, most of them are liberals, and so their solution always is more government, whether that be more American government or more world government. We always have these two alternatives. The liberals say there's this horrendous problem, we need more government. The conservatives respond by saying, no, it's not such a problem, it's not a big deal, uh, actually you're overstating the problem and so forth. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about war or health care or the environment or whatever it is, the liberals say we've got to have more government to solve it. The conservatives fight back by saying, no, it's not the problem you think it is. Well, it almost always is the problem that the liberals think it is, but the solution, of course, is not more government. The solution is to get the government out of it. Government is force. Government is, as the famous saying goes, a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Give these people the power to do things like this, and you give them the power to wreak havoc on the world. And we have seen it over and over and over again. And I hope, I hope that somehow we can restrain this government, get it back to live by the Constitution, make it the small government and the symbol of liberty and peace that at one time attracted people from all over the world who wanted to be Americans because we were the land of the free, not the home of the brave. Another lie that was told was that Harry Truman, when he announced the dropping of the bomb, said it was dropped on Hiroshima, a military center. Well, Hiroshima was far from a military center. There were no military facilities there at all. The only thing you could say about it was that there were factories on the outskirts of town, and factories can produce goods, which maybe free up other factories then to be producing military supplies or something of that sort. But the fact is that they didn't even drop the bomb on the factories. They dropped it right in the center of the city, in the heart of a civilian area. And the reason they chose Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were two of the only four large Japanese cities that had not already been bombed beyond devastation up to that point of the war. There was no point in dropping the bomb on Tokyo or any of the other major cities like Osaka or any of those because they had already been bombed beyond belief. And there was very little damage to be done, and apparently they wanted to display the greatest amount of damage to show how devastating the weapon was. The last point that should be discussed is why did they do it if they didn't have to? Why did Harry Truman and James Burns decide to go ahead, not offer the Japanese surrender on terms that eventually were the terms on which the surrender took place, and just go ahead and drop the bomb anyway? And I really don't know for sure, but it appears that both Truman and Burns were convinced that the dropping of the bomb was necessary to show the Soviets how strong the Americans were and to keep the Soviets in line after the Second World War was over. Boy, that really did a good job, didn't it? Three years later, Harry Truman perpetrated the war scare that got the defense budget tripled and put America in a state of absolute fright, saying that the Soviets were about to invade Western Europe, when in fact their own intelligence was telling them that there wasn't a chance in the world that the Soviets would be invading any country because of the fact that they were so devastated from the war and they had their buffer zone now with Czechoslovakia and Hungary and so forth. So once again, the politicians lied for their own purposes, and it didn't matter that hundreds of thousands of people died. But well, let's go to the phones and see what's going on out in the real world. Let's talk to, is that Scotch in Florida or Scott? That's Scotch, just like Scotch and water. Well, that's what it says on my screen, Scotch, but I just wanted to be sure because I didn't want to accuse you of being a dirty foreigner or something. Well, I am a dirty uh, dirty old man, but not a dirty foreigner. <laughs> you know. 
Well, I, I, I'm using that uh, suede name because I'm going to my class reunion here in another month, and that was my nickname in high school. Oh. As a matter of fact, most of my old buddies still call me that. So well, I thought all I'd right, Scotch, tell us what's on your mind then. Well, I just wanted to give you a little bit more information on the uh, dropping of the bomb in Japan. The Japanese started sending out peace feelers as early as 1942. You probably knew that. But uh, I just thought that I would... Uh, uh, you know, mention it because you didn't mention it there, and I just thought that I would. But I thought one of the most interesting things was that they, uh, a military intelligence officer with access to classified information gave a copy of a pre, uh, peace proposal stipulation, and uh, he was told to keep it confidential until the war ended. His name was Trohan, and he kept his part of the bargain, and the article was not published until five days after Japanese surrender. And this article had stated that General MacArthur had sent a communique to President Roosevelt in January of 1945 stating the Japanese were willing to surrender under these terms which included a full surrender of Japanese forces on sea and in the air and at home, surrender of all arms and munitions, occupation of the Japanese homeland and island possessions, Japanese relinquishment of Manchuria, Korea, and Formosa, and regulations of all prisoners of war and internees in Japan and in areas under Japanese control. And these were the identical terms the United States accepted from Japan when the war was over. Now, Roosevelt received that communique two days before he uh, left to go with uh, me at Yalta, and he rejected the proposal and told the aide that gave it to him. He said, MacArthur's our greatest general, but our poorest politician. <laughs> then shortly after General MacArthur returned to the United States from Korea in 1951, his neighbor at the Waldorf Astoria, which was the former President Herbert Hoover, took that Trohan article to the general, who confirmed its accuracy in every detail and without qualifications. But you don't hear that too much, do you? No, you don't. And another point that goes along with that is that the United States broke the Japanese codes even before Pearl Harbor. Oh, of course. So when the Japanese were putting peace feelers out through Switzerland and Russia and other places like that, the Americans were always aware of it. It wasn't as though that information was not getting through to the Americans. And well, that journalist, incidentally, was Walter Trohan, who was a longtime columnist for the Chicago Tribune. I believe right. that's whom you're talking about. Right. We have to take a break right now, but we will be back oh. in a couple of minutes. If you have anything more to say, Scott, stay on the line. This is Harry Brown. You can join us at 1-800-510-TALK. Hello again, Harry Brown here. We're talking with Scotch in Florida. Before we go back to Scotch, I got an email from David in Minneapolis who says that a while ago he heard a disturbing speculation about why we dropped the second bomb on Nagasaki without asking the Japanese if they were ready to surrender now. The first bomb dropped on Hiroshima was a fission bomb and the second was a fusion bomb. And the speculation is that the U.S., anticipating post-war tensions with the Soviet Union, wanted a field test of a fusion bomb to see if it could be relied upon as a weapon. Supposedly, the people of Hiroshima were the last casualties of World War II, and the people of Nagasaki were the first casualties of the Cold War. Do you know if there's any truth to this? Well, no, I don't know that it was done for a field test, although I can certainly understand that possibility. They definitely were two different types of bombs. I'm not much of an expert on uh, nuclear fission or fusion, but one of them was uranium-based and the other was plutonium-based, and you have just heard the extent of my scientific knowledge on the subject. And it may be that they wanted to check out both of them. The second one was more devastating, even though fewer people were killed, mainly because it was in a less populated uh, city. Let's go back to Florida now and continue with Scotch. You had another point you wanted to make, Scotch. Well, well just a couple of them. Um, you know, the PBS back in the 70s said that the uh, Japanese sent a cable that said that they were willing to surrender under any conditions, and uh, the uh, State Department didn't get that delivered uh, to the powers that be until August. And they said the reason they didn't was because they had trouble with the translation, yet the cable was sent in English. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> I, I well, they, two, they were all products of government schools. It could be. I, I got two more little points. You know, Harry Stimson, you mentioned uh, the Secretary of War. And his Henry, time. please do not take the name of Harry in vain. Uh, Henry sorry. Stimson. <laughs> oh, was it Henry? I'm sorry. Yeah. But he said that, the, or his diary said that, he had a meeting, you know, went to a meeting uh, of the cabinet meeting today to discuss how we could best get Japan to attack Pearl Harbor. This was six months before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, at least mm -hmm. five months. Uh, one other point, talking about the re uh, reconstruction, you know, of, of uh, Iraq and everything, I just ran across a book called Judgment in Berlin, and it was, happened to the judge that, that tried the case wrote the book. Is this the Nuremberg trials you're talking about? No, it wasn't the Nuremberg. No, it, it had to do with uh, two East Germans that hijacked an airplane and oh. flew it into West Berlin. Right uh -huh. Now, you and I probably thought, or at least a lot of the listeners thought, that we went over there and turned that country into a democracy. But this guy found out that up until at least 1979, and I'm not sure that it's not still that way, West Berlin has absolutely no more rights than they had under Hitler. There's absolutely no democracy there at all. All the laws came through our State Department. And when the State Department wanted a law passed, all they did was write the law out and give it to the German government. And that was the law. Well, uh, I'm not 
familiar with that. Are you saying that they were under still under military occupation in West Berlin? Because it was of the that? occupation authorities that they were under up until, and the book was written in 1979. So mm-hmm. and up until then, yeah. yeah. Uh, for years. anybody who listening who doesn't understand the context, there you had West Germany and East Germany, and Berlin, which was in East Germany, was divided into several zones: Four. Soviet, British, French, and English. American, excuse me, and the American, French, and British combined into one zone eventually. So that was really East Berlin and West Berlin. But West Berlin was completely surrounded by East Germany, and so that may be why they continued, or the justification they had for continuing the military occupation rather than letting them operate their own government the way the West Germans did. Well, the bad part of that, according to the judge, and he even asked the prosecutors, the prosecutor's uh, client happened to be the State Department, and he said, well, this has the same meaning for any American that comes over here to West Berlin as a tourist. They have no rights either. And the guys refused to answer him on that. Hmm. But well, he, glad I didn't go to West Berlin before the Berlin Wall fell. Yeah, I, yeah. I just thought. Oh, I just thought that I would uh, mention those few things there. Sure. And I, one other point I might make is Admiral William Leahy, who was the uh, admiral. He was Roosevelt's. So he was aide. the head of the navy, in other words. Yeah, he was Roosevelt's aide, and he said that you know when they had those meetings with Nimitz and MacArthur when Roosevelt went over there, they never discussed that because they knew that Japan was defeated after uh, when they got their uh, navy defeated after Midway, mm-hmm. and uh, there was nobody ever talked about that. And and in his book, uh, I was there. Mm-hmm. He thought that, uh, as a matter of fact, i got a statement here, if you'd like a real quick statement. Well, we need to move on, Scott. Okay. We've got people lined up on the phones. But I appreciate all the information you've passed on to us, and stay in touch with us. Oh, I sure will. You just come on too late, and sometimes I fall asleep. I I'll really s- enjoy your program. I'll drink some more coffee, Scott, and stay up. Thanks so much for calling. Let's go now to Pennsylvania and talk with Jim. Jim, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Brad. How are you? I'm just fine. What's up? Well, speaking of uh, presidents leading us into war, I thought maybe you could clear up something for me. I, I listened to some of the uh, statements from George Bush's speech, and I kind of left me scratching my head. He said two things that, I, uh, that were picked up as sound bites. But first of all, what speech are you talking about? This press conference of the past week? Yes. Okay, go ahead. And he said, I take responsibility for everything that I say. Which I thought, well, okay, I guess. <laughs> does that mean he's resigning? Yes. He, uh, <laughs> go what ahead. exactly does he mean by that? He doesn't mean anything by that. As a matter of fact, I have that right here in front of me. And the question that was posed to him was, you often speak about the need for accountability in many areas. I wonder then, why is Dr. Rice not being held accountable for the statement that your own White House has acknowledged was a mistake in your State of the Union address regarding Iraq's attempts to purchase uranium? And also, do you take personal responsibility for that inaccuracy? That was the question from the reporter. The answer from President Bush was, I take personal responsibility for everything I say, of course. Absolutely. I also take responsibility for making decisions on war and peace, and I analyze the thorough body of intelligence, good, solid, sound intelligence, that led me to come to the conclusion that that it was necessary to remove Saddam Hussein from power. We gave the world a chance to do it. We had, remember, there's, again, I don't want to get repetitive here, but it's important to remind everybody that there was 12 resolutions that came out, of the, and it goes on from there. I mean, it's just way off in left field again, wandering around, never saying, look, it was a mistake, I said it, Either I didn't know that it was a mistake when I said it, or I knew it and I shouldn't have said it. No responsibility whatsoever, just the appearance of it. And it really amazed me when I saw the headlines on news stories that said Bush takes responsibility for the remark, because he didn't. And here I'm walking all over what you wanted to say, Jim. You take the floor. Well, um, you know, you've cleared that part up. Uh, I also found the second part of that statement very interesting. I also take responsibility for decisions of war and peace. Yes. And I'm wondering if he has the same constitution that I have. Uh, Mine says that Congress has that responsibility. Absolutely. So... By him stating that, is uh, is that impeach- an impeachable offense? Is that treasonous? <laughs> Lying is not an impeachable offense. But you know what the Bushbackers say is, well, Congress passed the resolution letting him go to war. No, Congress passed a resolution saying you do whatever you want, which is contrary to what the Constitution wanted, which was for Congress to deliberate and say, Yes, we hereby declare war on Iraq, or no, we do not declare war on Iraq. The Constitution does not say you can just pass a resolution and delegate to President Bush the opportunity to just decide whatever he comes to as a means of sifting through all this evidence. That evidence had to be brought before Congress, and the fact that they circumvented that was one of the reasons that all of this junk about uranium being bought in Africa, about the aluminum tubes, about the atomic energy report, about the al-Qaeda connections, and on and on and on, and all of these lies were never examined at the time before anybody did anything because they had had circumvented the whole process that you're supposed to go through. In the First World War, Wilson made a strong case that the United States should go into World War I. I don't agree with the case by any means whatsoever, but he went before Congress and made a strong case. It was three days after that before Congress passed the Declaration of War because they examined it, they got up and talked about it, they looked at the evidence, they weighed the possibilities, they brought up alternative policies that could 
perhaps achieve whatever it was that they thought they were going to achieve by getting into war. But that didn't happen, not with the Gulf War, not with the Korean War, not with the Vietnam War, and certainly not with this last war against Iraq. The whole process was circumvented. And as a result, no congressman has to take responsibility, which is what the Constitution wanted the congressman to do. Now these Democratic candidates can go out and complain about the way Bush went about all of this, but the fact is that they voted to abdicate their own responsibility in this. Jim, I'm walking all over you again. Please, please, don't let me interrupt you. No, you're doing fine. The, uh... The other part of this topic I, I thought was interesting are comments from the Democratic presidential candidates about this mm -hmm. and how they're, oh, so outraged about this deceit and, oh, it's so terrible that, you know, we have a president that, 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 you know, that lied to us over this important issue. And now look at this whole mess we're in. Most of, at least, I don't know, at least four or five of these presidential candidates voted to hand over their constitutional authority. Definitely. So, unfortunately, uh, I kind of feel that they're figuring out now what the Founding Fathers knew hundreds of years ago, that, it can, that a single man can make a mistake and that's why we don't let the president make these kind of important decisions. Have that kind of power, definitely, absolutely, definitely, certainly, without question. One other point about this is that it's easy to feel now, as people who are not absolutely wedded to the Republican Party, that anybody would be better than Bush, and that as a result, we should go to the polls and vote for any Democrat who runs against Bush next year who gets the nomination, even if it's Hillary Clinton or Howard Dean or anyone else, people who on the domestic front want bigger, 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 bigger government, perhaps even in their rhetoric, bigger than what Bush has given us over the last two and a half years. But we have to remember that when these people tell us how much they're opposed to war and how much they're opposed to doing this and that. We have to remember that what Bush said, he was opposed to nation building. He was in favor of limited government. He was in favor of other foreign policy solutions besides rushing in and thinking we were going to build democracies in countries around the world and so forth. So what you will get if you elect a Democratic president is all that big government like universal health care and other things of that sort and probably a foreign policy president who is little better, if at all, than Bush is. We are not going to get anything from any Republican or any Democrat. And to me, there are only two solutions. You either vote Libertarian or you don't vote at all. And not voting at all is a valid way to approach the, the question and to say, I have nobody I can vote for, nobody I'm comfortable with, and I am certainly not going to be able to live with myself if I vote to support someone I know will take us into war and who will make the government bigger. So we have to be careful about going with the anyone but Bush attitude, just as people took the attitude anyone but Clinton and voted for Dole and George H.W. Bush earlier, and then anybody but Gore gave us this wonderful George W. Bush as president who's created all these problems. Jim, thank you very much for calling. I appreciate your comments, and stay in touch with us. Before we go back to the phones, one quick email about the topic we've been talking about tonight. Pete in... Knoxville, Tennessee, says, I've often wondered why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. The history books, most of which are written at the direction of the U.S. government via the various school systems, are incomplete. Did Japan attack Pearl Harbor because the U.S. had cut off their supply of crude petroleum? Well, that's another subject, the beginning of the war rather than the ending of the war. And we've discussed it before, and I'm sure we'll discuss it again, but let me just say a quick summary of it is that for a year and a half prior to Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt was browbeating the Japanese, telling them to get out of East Asia, where they were trying to get the resources that they felt they needed. The British, the French, the Dutch all had colonies in East Asia. Japan wanted them, too, to be able to get resources from there the way the other countries were. But Roosevelt kept browbeating them to get out of China, to get out of Indochina, to get out of uh, the various areas there, Indonesia and so forth, and Korea. The Japanese finally decided that war was inevitable with the United States, and if that was going to happen, then they ought to attack someplace and try to destroy the American fleet, even though they didn't see how they could win the war, even if they did destroy the American fleet, because even then, America was the most powerful country in the world, the most productive country in the world, and they knew that it would just be a matter of time until they lost the war, but they wanted to prolong that as much as possible by getting the biggest possible advantage at the start. Now, that's a Reader's Digest version. Sometime we'll discuss it in more detail. Right now, though, we're going to go all the way up to Alaska and talk with Doug. Good evening, Doug. Thanks for waiting. Yeah, good evening, uh, Harry. Enjoy your show. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I guess I'm going to run some figures uh, by you. I'm, I'm going to disagree um, with you, I guess, on uh, the Truman, President Truman's decision, decision to drop the bomb. Um, I, I haven't finished my World War II studies yet, but I have <clears throat> some figures here. Um, and there's some things that I, pro I think you should emphasize. One was the, um, the President Truman's emotion at the time. Another one would be the Japanese culture. And then maybe another one would be the corrupt uh, military regime running Japan. But I don't know who uh, what who made the decision on the uh, gradual invasion of Japan. I don't know if it was Nimitz or the Joint Chiefs, but as I understand it, the policy was uh, island island hopping. And I, and I don't that's, have that's what they had been doing up to then, and mm -hmm. they assumed that 
In November of 45, they would invade Kyoto, which is way down at the bottom of the Japanese chain, and then later they would invade Honshu, which is the main Japanese island, and they wouldn't do that until May of 46. Is, is that what you're talking about? Well, I, the, um, I just finished, uh, the figures I have were for Tarawa, and it looks like uh, just, that's just uh, smaller than Iwo Jima, I guess, but there were uh, a thousand American, probably Marines, that were killed, and then 2,000, and another thousand wounded. Oh, yes, and, there's no question. In all the island battles, Iwo Jima, Tarawa, uh, Okinawa, and so on, uh, Tens of thousands of Americans and uh, even more Japanese were killed. And because the American people were getting that kind of news all the time in the newspapers, it was very easy for them to believe the stories that a million casualties would result from trying to invade the Japanese islands. So nobody disputes the fact that it would be a difficult thing. It's just that the military's own estimates of that put the range of casualties in 10 to 30,000, whereas Truman and Stimson and these others were talking about a quarter of a million to a million. So they were inflating it just like George Bush has been inflating stories about Iraq in order to try to get us to think that this is an absolute necessity. Well, uh, I, see, I see what you mean, but my point is that you, you can um, take uh, the figures from the, the small islands and project that onto the large island of Japan, I guess. Well, don't you think the military would have done that? Would have well, taken yeah, that into consideration? I, I think they're, they're, I guess, you know, nowadays we do some kind of a statistical analysis. I, I don't know what they had back then, but they were, uh, well, not only American troops, but um, this from Doug, Tarawa. Doug, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you don't mind just sit, uh, waiting on the phone again while we listen to the news, I want to give you the time to, to get this out properly. Yeah, what I, I want to go over was, and I'm using uh, Tarawa as the example, uh, I think we went over the American figures, but for the Japanese uh, troops, um, of the 5,000 uh, Japanese troops, I think 17 survived. And uh, what the Marines were seeing was this, I think an awful lot of them was uh, suicide. This yes. Part of the Japanese uh, culture that I was um, referring to. And not only that, in some of the islands, uh, I don't know if the uh, officers or the, the military on these islands, what they told the Japanese civilians about the Americans. But I think they probably said, well, you know, when the Americans come, you're going to be killed. They're going to plunder and rape your wife, take your children or whatever. But I, I, the impression I have is that they were terrified of the American Marines, and they were commit, committing suicide, too. So, sure. And what I want to do, if you're seeing this on these small islands, you can certainly project that onto um, uh, the large island of, of Japan. Yes, all that was taken into consideration at the time. They they felt that if there were an invasion of Japan, the Japanese would fight to the death, and that the, they, there would be a lot of suicide fighters, people who would fight to the death rather than surrender, just as they had kamikaze pilots who... Uh, intentionally ran their planes into American ships as an act of suicide to destroy American ships. And all of that was taken into consideration. But the point was that nobody in the American high command believed that it would ever come to that invasion. And so even if we dispute the figures that the American high command estimated as the projected American casualties, even if those were erroneous, we still were uh, left with the fact that they didn't expect an invasion to take place. And I agree that it is possible that the blockade might not have brought them about uh, brought about a surrender. It's possible that the Soviet entry into the war might not have brought about a surrender. It is possible that the Japanese would never have offered to give up the emperor. But nobody, well, pardon me, Truman and Burns were not willing to wait to see if those things worked. They wanted to drop that bomb, apparently, because they wanted to demonstrate to the world how powerful the United States was. So it really isn't important whether the estimates of the invasion figures were correct. Well, uh, um, on the um, blockade, you're absolutely right. I, I think it was working, but, but then, you're, you know, what you're saying is um, it could have led to the starvation of, of millions of Japanese. I mean, they were... They were already, yes. Yeah, so you're, they're, 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 you have the, not only the perhaps million American lives, you've got two to three million uh, Japanese lives that would probably um, uh, at stake. And then, um, as I understand it, even after the second bomb was, was dropped, they, the, the, the military regime in power there, we're thinking of, uh, of killing or capturing the emperor, and uh, finally, I mean, he, 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 at one of the meetings, he said, that, that's it, we're, and uh, apparently he would never speak at these meetings, but when he spoke, they, they responded to that. Yes, you're correct about that. He did not take part in foreign policy, but eventually he said, we can't have this anymore, we will surrender on whatever terms, and if they take me, so be it. Yeah, and then, well, the other point I, I want to make was Truman's emotion. I, 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 you certainly see that uh, today with Iraq, with, with uh, President Bush. I mean, when these soldiers uh, die in the service of the country, they have to, the president has to send some kind of a letter, and um, these are agonizing certainly for President Bush, and then for Truman to write uh, a million of these uh, letters, I mean, it's, it's an awful thought. So you, uh, President Truman is certainly between a, a rock and a hard place, and he, he chose to, to end it right, right now. It wasn't certainly pleasant, and... Uh, it's uh, a terrible uh, uh, loss of life, both civilian, but it, it did end the war. Well, why did he lie about it? 
Pardon me? Why did he lie about it? Well, if, if, I don't, I don't if it know. was the I mean, right decision, why didn't he just say, this is how I made the decision? But instead, he figured he had to lie about it. He had to use figures that were contrary to everything his advisors told him. He said they dropped the bomb on a military center, that they would never attack civilians knowingly, when in fact they dropped it in the middle of a city in a residential area. And he lied about it from beginning to end. But of course, that was in his character. He was probably the all-time liar in the White House, even more so than Bill Clinton or anybody else that we're more familiar with. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I can't comment on that, but it's hard to time warp and go back and, and, and analyze a lot of that because it was a, a terrible war, and, and I don't, you know, war is, nobody wants. Uh, but they, they, I really uh, admire the uh, World War II um, veterans and, and what they went through compared to some of the things that, uh, you know, we've had to uh, endure. It's just nothing. They, they were the ones, um, certainly one of the greatest generations, uh, what they had to go through. But anyway, I was going to read um, Douglas MacArthur's two-sentence two speech here on the USS Missouri, and it might apply to Iraq, but it says... Um, it is my earnest hope, indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion a better world shall emerge. Out of the blood and carnage of the past, the world founded upon faith and understanding, the world dedicated to the dignity of man, the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. And that, that Wonderful is. sentiments, and they're uttered in every war, that uh, when this war is over, we're going to see to it that this never happens again, and we're going to have a better world as a result, and it never happens, does it? Doug, thanks so much for okay, calling. Thanks a lot. You got it. Let's go to California and talk with Michael. Good evening, Michael. Good evening, Harry. Um, you were talking earlier about the problem with large government and so on, and I'd like to hear what your uh, idea is. That, assuming your concept of um, Im an impotent government um, was implemented, um, what would be done to stop a imperialist such as Bush, Hitler, or whatever? You know, right right now, um, a, a country can. Uh, I mean, we invaded in, uh, Iran, Iraq, actually, but um, we've, you know, and it wasn't there. He's not a nice guy, but nevertheless, we invaded. But uh, assuming somebody was going to evade us invade us, and we didn't have a strong government, um, what would what would be done? Well, first of all, mind our own business, so, yeah. that, so that people would have no reason to want to hurt Americans. America has been attacked only twice in its entire history. The first time was at Pearl Harbor, and we discussed earlier the fact that this would not have happened if Roosevelt hadn't been bullying the Japanese, because the last thing they wanted to do in the middle of a war against China is to have to take on the United States. And then uh, the second time was, we will say, the World Trade Center, and of course this came after numerous American intrusions and other countries around the world telling people who their government must be, overthrowing governments, troops in over 100 countries around the world, CIA coups, and on and on yeah. and on and on. If we minded our own business, why would anybody want to come after us? Oh, Second, we've got a lot of stuff. Second, we're, we're a big manufacturer. You know, we, we still have a lot of manufacturing. We, we have a lot of stuff that other countries would want. But countries do not invade other countries to take over their productive capacities, they invade them to take over their resources. Yeah, exactly, the same thing. Because, no, it isn't the oh, same okay, thing. Saying, okay, you, 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 take over somebody, you take over somebody's factories does not guarantee that you are going to get the production that was coming out of those factories before, especially if you change the economic system. But right. you take over the resources and you do with them whatever you want. And yeah. Hitler didn't invade the Sudetenland in order to get their workers or their factories. He invaded them for the iron and steel that was not available after the First World War because that area had been taken away from him. Agreed with you, what I'm saying is, essentially, we have... I mean, we just turn the whole scenario around and say, if somebody, for whatever reason, wanted to invade us, if we had my, my impression of what you're talking about of an impotent government, then we wouldn't necessarily be capable of taking care of things. Well, first of all, we need to understand that small government does not mean impotent government. And secondly, small government does not mean defenseless government. When this country in 1960 had a total budget of $80 billion for everything, it was as safe and well defended as our government is today when the defense budget alone is well over $300 billion. We have the biggest national offense in the history of the world. We can annihilate. I say we, and I shouldn't do that. The government, our government, can annihilate any country in the world at a moment's notice. We can bend countries, break them, make them bend to our will. All of that is possible, and yet... This country is absolutely defenseless against any two-bit dictator who can get his hands on a nuclear missile. That's why it's so easy for George Bush to frighten Americans by talking about unmanned aircraft that can carry biological weapons over here or drop a nuclear bomb or whatever it might be that he wants to scare us with, whatever bogeyman he has in mind. What we need to do is, as I said, mind our own business, get out of other countries, end foreign aid, end all kinds of military assistance to other countries, get our government out of the arms business so that we are not considered a threat to anybody and we're not going to take sides in anybody else's problems. Next, we need to have a defense. For 40 years, the technology has existed to produce a missile defense so that we could defend this country against the two-bit dictator who got his hands on a nuclear missile. Unfortunately, that technology has been in the hands of the Defense Department, and of course nobody else has an incentive to produce the kind of missile defense that might make this country safe. So if I were president, I would ask Congress to put up a reward of, let's say, $25 billion or whatever would be the appropriate figure to the first company that can actually produce 
not promise, not estimate, not deliver plans, but actually produce a working missile defense and demonstrate its use. And that reward would be paid in full. And any other company that tried to get it and didn't succeed could probably sell what they had learned to other countries around the world, and other countries having the ability to defend themselves would not be a threat to us. Lastly, we should, if we do run into trouble with somebody else, if some idiot, insane dictator, whether that's Saddam Hussein or Kim Il-jung or whoever it might be, Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, whatever, actually threaten this country, which Hussein did not do, but somebody actually threatened to do something to this country, the president should go on worldwide TV and say that if you carry out this threat, if you attack the United States of America, I will put up a reward of like $100 million to the first person who can assassinate you. And everybody is eligible for this. People of your country, people of our country, your bodyguards, your wives, whoever, anybody can do it. And we should be targeting the people who are actually threatening us, not innocent civilians who always are the ones who suffer for the sins of the politicians. That's what a defense should be, and it wouldn't cost more than about $25 billion a year after you spent that $25 billion for the missile defense. Does that make sense, Michael? That, that makes a lot of sense, Harry, but I'm wondering, um, number one, with our surveillance methodology now, satellite surveillance and so on and so on, um, can't we probably keep a very good uh, tally on who has what as far as the big stuff? Now, the little stuff, as, as we know, you can, uh, it's, we can make anthrax here. Uh, a good chemist and so on. There's a lot of, of things that the crazies can make, um, and they don't, have to, they don't have to put in an ICBM. They can bring it over here. They, um, the, you know, the sarin thing the Japanese were doing, so on and so on. So uh, I would say that the big problem is not the ICBM, but you know, the, uh, primarily as you're talking about going around irritating everybody and where everybody um, considers us to be the bad guys. Sure, I, if we be nice, we would be decent. I agree with that, Michael, completely, but it is the ICBMs that are used to scare Americans into accepting John Ashcroft's proposals for a police state and George Bush's proposals to go over and attack other countries. And that's why we need to have a defense. And I think it would be a good thing, even if it weren't that they were using it as an excuse, because there may someday be another Soviet Union that seems to be menacing the world. And uh, it may be China or somebody else, and it seems to me that it makes good sense to have that kind of a defensive weapon available. Yeah, I'm just saying there's so many so many alternative things that we're not, It's again, um, it's not the nation. Uh, the right now we're you know the, I, it wasn't a nation that blew up the buildings in New York. Right. It, uh, it was a private group of uh, of people that just really <laughs> did not agree with where we are and where we were taking them. Right. And you know the that can't that's not something that um, can be handled other than by uh, the cooperation among countries where everybody is working uh, you know, or at least the vast majority is working to solve that problem. Which probably would not succeed because we're talking about governments and bureaucrats. Ah, uh, that music reminds us that even if we spend two hours on this show talking about problems in the world, that there really is a lot of beauty in this world, especially for those of us who were lucky enough to be born here and not in Liberia or someplace else around the world. And we just cannot forget that because you only have one life and you do not want to throw away taking all the burdens of the world on your shoulder. We're talking with Michael in California, and before the break, Michael made the point that the foreign policy that I suggested would probably be very effective against foreign states that threatened us, but it would not necessarily stop somebody coming into the country with a suitcase bomb or something else. Two points need to be made. First, as David Berglund said, utopia is not an option. There is no policy, there is no solution, there is no program, there is no plan that is going to plug every loophole in the universe. There is no way that can be done. Even setting up an absolute police state in this country with no freedoms left whatsoever would not make us secure against the suitcase bomb or any of these other things. The second point that I need to make is that even though there are people in the world who just love hurting other people, and a lot of those people become terrorists, and no change in American foreign policy is going to stop those people from being the kind of people they are. The fact of the matter is those people can't hurt us unless they can get the support of widespread numbers of people who will give them the money, give them the connections, give them the influence, give them the resources that they need to be able to threaten us. The World Trade Center attack was not created on a whim by somebody using $65 and a handful of wire and maybe a little homemade bomb he created in his cellar. No, it was the result of extensive planning, extensive communications, extensive connections, extensive uses of money. All sorts of things had to go into that, and that requires the support of a great number of people, not just the 21 people who presumably were involved in the act itself, but thousands, and if not millions, of people around the world. And when you change American foreign policy, you do not give those millions of people the incentive to help the terrorists. 
and we would not have to worry about those mean, brutal, sadistic people around the world if we didn't incite other people to give them what they want. Let me go back now to Michael. Did you want to carry on? Yes, further? I, agree, I agree with your point that uh, you know, our, one of our big things is we, we irritate everybody else, and therefore they, um, you know, we're exporting our culture and destroying their culture and so on. However, uh, wasn't that the World Trade Center that was blown up by essentially two guys? Um, anyway, that's that. Are you talking about 1993? Right. Yeah, um, I don't I mean, know all the details of that. Okay, well, in the case of two guys, they went out and bought a lot of fertilizer and a lot of diesel oil and mixed it up, and they made one heck of a really good bomb and blew the building <laughs> to, you know, completely destroy the whole thing. But the point I'm trying to make is, um, if we are isolationists, which it sounds like to me what you're talking about, then we have another country over there that for whatever reason does not like us or what we're doing. And if we are not in some sort of an organization, a world organization, where we have agreed upon common rules and agreed upon a common defense force, where... When something happens, we are all in communication with one another, and we can say, by the way, um, I don't know what's going on, but this guy is trying to come over there and blow your country up, but uh, you know, uh, we have uh, apprehended him, or somebody looks like there's a group that's trying to do something, they're called IKEA, um, these are some of the people that are there, you probably want to go over and uh, keep your eyes out for them, essentially inter-cooperation among as many nations, you know, the majority of nations. It's not going to be an easy thing, but the United Nations is up and functioning, and we, the United States, are instrumental in keeping it rather gutless. They do a lot of stuff, but we, everybody has a veto, and uh, so we stop a lot of things. We don't donate, you know, we don't pay our bill on them, and so on and so on. So we are largely responsible for their impotence. Well, but, the you dream, know, they could do better. What you propose there as this wonderful organization has been the dream of people for centuries, and it has never worked. The League of Nations, the United Nations, and one of the reasons is that whoever is the strongest, most powerful country will tend to take over and do whatever it wants, as the United States has done. But that's an, you've got another approach, and you can continue to, to hope for that if you like. Michael, thanks for joining us tonight. You always have interesting things to say. Let's go to Jack in Tennessee. Good morning. Is this Jack? Yeah, this is Jack. Oh, hi there, Jack. What's on your mind tonight? Well, I just wanted to create, uh, create your history a little bit. All right. Uh, you were talking about that Pearl Harbor was one of the first times that the country had been attacked. You were a little bit wrong. Uh, if you remember back in the War of 1812, the, uh, the British came in and burned what they called Washington City. Yes, was, but that was after the war had started. Uh, yeah. What I was talking about is an unprovoked, apparently unprovoked attack on the United States, which is the thing we would have to defend ourselves from. Obviously, if we declare war on another country, then it's very, very possible that America will be attacked. Well, there's no doubt America will be attacked again, because we leave, we're, uh, with our open borders situation we have with our borders right now, there's no way to contain any terrorists from coming into this country. When you have people at, uh, on their southern border, over 5,000 people crossing the border every day, I mean, uh, how are you going to stop someone with the intent to destroy this country or create havoc when uh, they're willing to, to uh, sacrifice their lives, you know, to further their ideas, uh, you, you're not going to be able to stop these people from coming in. The United States is just going to have to face the fact that we are going to be attacked again, and it would uh, serve us good, you know, to look at, at the uh, places we are most vulnerable. I haven't heard anyone speak of the fact that uh, there are five major bridges across the uh, Mississippi River in this country. If they were destroyed, uh, the economy of this country would collapse. Well, I don't think it would collapse, but it would certainly be a very bad thing. Well, what is your solution to all this? Well, it's the immigration problem. We have got to close our borders. Entirely? Uh, Not let anybody in? Well, I mean, you know, do, the, the immigration laws in this country are shambles. You know, What do you mean by shambles? Uh, when you can allow that, that many illegal aliens that can cross the border every day, how, I mean, they don't, they don't have to be Mexican. They can be Arab, or they can be Saudi Arabia, they can be Iraqis, Iranians. Uh, but if, if it's so easy to cross our southern borders, how are we going to protect ourselves? You know, uh, how are you going to stop them? Uh, that is a major problem, which I, I, I don't know what the real answer to it is, but I've listened to lots of reports from the Border Patrol and stuff that say at the present rate, even the drug dealers that are bringing drugs into this country have gotten so bold and emboldened that they actually have gotten into uh, gunfights with the Border Patrol. You know, if our Border Patrol is so weak, I would hate to see it become a military situation. But uh, personally, I don't see any other way that you can do it, you know, unless you put military personnel on our borders. Is this the way you want to live with America as an armed fortress? Well, it's not the way I want to live. It's not what I envision America as being. But, you know, harsh situations and difficult times uh, sometimes dictate situations, you know, that you have, to, uh, you have to address the situation as it is. You know, it may not be right. It may not be what we want. But if we don't stop the illegal flow of these people into this country, you might as well throw your hands up and just say, well, it's over. Well, do you think the crisis would be over if the right things were done? Well, this is not an overnight situation. It didn't happen in one day. It didn't happen in one year. It didn't happen in two years. It would take a long time to get it straightened back out. But, you know, you have to start somewhere. You know, if we allow this to go on unchecked, we're just, you know, it's, it's like offering your throat to your enemy, you know. It's like, go ahead, cut my jugular vein, you know.
Well, I have to say that we have been living in a state of crisis for 62 years now, starting in 1941 with the Pearl Harbor and all the way through World War II and then almost immediately after World War II, the Cold War. Then the Berlin Wall comes down and the Soviet Union breaks up. And guess what? It's still a dangerous world out there. So America has to invade Panama. America has to invade Iraq. America has to invade Haiti. Then America has to invade Afghanistan. America has to send missiles to Sudan and Afghanistan. America has to invade Iraq again. And next year, America is going to have to invade somebody else. And we have been living in this state of crisis for 62 years. And at some point, you have to ask yourself, what is all of this for? What have they accomplished with all of this? They have never brought peace to America. They have never put us to a, brought us to a situation where now we can enjoy the liberties that they keep saying that Americans have. No, those are suspended temporarily while we fight this awful battle. And now you want to close the borders. And, of course, you're not just talking about keeping out immigrants. You're talking about every American citizen carrying an ID card, every American citizen being oh, subjected. I definitely don't believe in ID cards. Well, how are you going to stop it? How are they going to know whether somebody walking the streets is a legal citizen or an illegal immigrant? And well, you're going to be <laughs> stopped and asked for your paper whenever any policeman or anybody else thinks you're suspicious. And neighbors are going to be asked to watch you to make sure you're not harboring illegal immigrants, just like they're being asked to watch to see that you're not doing something that might be aiding terrorists or perhaps having drugs in your house or something else. When do we go back to being the land of the free? Well, uh, with freedom comes, you know, the care of it. You have to watch what you, you have to do to be able to balance the two of it. It's the simplest form of uh, of taking care of this identity crisis, you know, or you're talking about papers for people, identity papers, you don't need that. You don't need a national, you know, registration, you know, for everybody in this country carrying papers. Uh, there was a senator from Tennessee, Fred Thompson, who suggested a program over uh, four or five years ago that uh, would have allowed when these people come into the country and try to get driver's license. You know, right there would have stopped it. You know, you'd have to have shown permanent resident status to obtain the driver's license. But as it is in most states right now, you do not have to show any type of, of uh, verification that you're an American citizen or anything else to obtain a driver's license. Okay, so they, so they have to have... License, you can get a social security card. You can get credit cards. Create a background where it appears that you uh, that you are a resident of this country. All right. So you plug all that up with oppressive laws of one kind or another that will create a brand new bureaucracy, and then people just go to counterfeiters and buy the same documents that they used to get from the United States government. We have to face the fact the government's war on drugs has not stopped drugs. The government's war on illiteracy has not made Americans any smarter. The government's war on poverty has expanded the poverty roles in America, and a government war on immigration is not going to work any better. A war on abortion is not going to do anything except maybe lead to men having abortions. It just doesn't work, and we have to find another answer. And the answer to me is in liberty. And I'll talk about that a little when we come back to our final segment after we take this break. I want to thank our callers tonight. We had some very interesting calls from Scotch and Jim and Doug and Michael and Rob and Jack. Well, not Rob. <laughs> we never did get to talk to Rob. But I do appreciate that. And most of all, I appreciate your listening. And I was thinking about uh, Jack's call during the break. You know, if you had a relative who said he wanted to start a business and he wanted to borrow $5,000 from you and you lend him the $5,000 and then six months later he comes back and says, well, we're just about to turn the corner with this business, but we really got a cash flow problem right now. I need another 5000 And then six months later he said, boy, we're really doing well with this business, but we need another 5000 And he just kept coming back to you. At some point you would say, this guy is a loser and I should quit throwing good money after bad. I should call a halt to this right now. But think about it for a minute. What greater loser is there than the United States government? The United States government has been interfering in education in this country for 50 years, and, of course, local governments have been running education for over 100 years, about 150 years now. Every year they tell us about the terrible conditions in the schools and how they need more money, and they get more money. Every year the education budget goes up everywhere. They talk about budget cuts, but all they're talking about is not adding as much to the education budget this year as they had hoped to add to it. It's still more than they spent last year. And still, they talk about overcrowded classrooms, about discipline in classes, about bullies on the schoolyard, about all the problems that they can't take care of because they don't have enough money. It's the same thing with health care. The government manages over half of the health care in this country today. It spends over half of the health care dollars, and another quarter of the health care dollars are spent in compliance with the tax laws by companies in group insurance. And yet they keep telling us that they need to have a prescription drug program. They need to reform Medicare. They need to do all of these things. The same thing with welfare. The same thing with any government program. Whatever the program, they just keep coming back and telling us how terrible things are and how much more money they need. When are we going to decide that government is as much a loser as that deadbeat relative who keeps wasting your money in that business that's never going to succeed? They haven't succeeded at anything. They talk about World War II as an example of what government can do. But... Hundreds of thousands of Americans died in World War II. That certainly wasn't the answer. And the moment the war was over, we were involved in another war that went on for 50 years after that almost. 
Charles Beard in the late 40s coined the expression perpetual war for perpetual peace. We are always going to war to bring about a peace, and the peace never comes. I'm tempted when I think of his statement to say, boy, he should see what's going on today. But he doesn't have to. He wouldn't be surprised. He's not alive anymore. But it's what he expected. He knew that this was going to happen, that it was just going to go on year after year, that we've got some emergency, and when we take care of that emergency, we'll have peace. When are we going to call a halt to all this? When are we going to say enough? When are we going to say this is supposed to be the land of the free? much, much more than the home of the brave. We don't have to prove ourselves to people elsewhere in the world. We don't have to show how tough we are. We don't have to show how strong we are, how powerful we are, and we certainly don't have to show how brutal we can be. What we need to do is to be that beacon of liberty that the Statue of Liberty represented, the light of freedom shining all over the world, bringing hope and inspiration to people everywhere so that they would want to be more like America. Today, nobody wants to be like America. Yeah, they want to eat our food, they want to listen to our music and see our movies, but nobody wants to be like the American government, and everybody around the world is pretty much afraid of the American government. We need to change that, and we're not going to change it by supporting people like George Bush or Al Gore or Howard Dean or any of these other people who have brought it about. We need to take a stand and say, I am not going to support big government anymore. Thank you again for joining me tonight. I look forward to talking with you again next week at this time. Same time, same place. Good night and have a good week.